Hey guys, Overlord Prime here, and I'm going to be bringing you a weird YouTube video. It's very rare, I don't really do this often, and again, like my YouTube videos, I'm not going to do any editing on this one. This is pretty much just my opinions, um, and this is going to be, as you can tell, a crew skill tier list. And this is meant to be a modern update with explanations to my 2020 picture that has been floating around. As you can see, this is the picture, drawn in crayon and in MS Paint. Then I ate those crayons. As you can see, for, for the most part, most of these crew skills, I would still put them where they are at. I wouldn't move them at all. Uh, but with the recent field mod changes and with new equipment coming out, um, obviously the tier list in this um, needs to be revised because some crew skills are going to move up and some obviously need to move down. And, well, let's, get, let's go look at it. And the reason why I'm doing this is while most content creators and most uh, players already have their opinions of where crew skills belong. They, you know, I have my own opinions. And obviously, the reason why my opinion matters is I'm correct. So we're going to go through the tier list. We're going to go through the tiers. And then we're going to slowly fill it up with crew skills that fit in that tier. So we're going to begin with SS tier. This is the cream of the crop, the best skill in the game. And that's going to be Six Sense. Six Sense is objectively the best skill in the game, and it's a skill you must have all the time. And the reason is Six Sense will show a light bulb on your head if you get spotted three seconds after you were in an unspotted situation. And the reason why this is good is because it gives you information. And most importantly, it gives you information on what the enemy knows. It is the only skill in the entire game where the entire purpose of it is to let you know what the other team knows. And as a defensive tool, it's very good. Uh, early game, it lets you know if the enemy's taken an aggressive spot. It lets you know if they have information on your early positioning. And late game, it lets you know if a position you're going to rotate out to or if your movements are already known. And this gives you a good idea of whether or not you're going to successfully make a good flank or if you're going to have to deal with enemies that are prepared for you. It can also be used as an offensive tool. Um, if you abuse the mechanic where you will pop the light bulb off after three seconds, you can control this by exposing certain parts of your vehicle to a known enemy position, slowly exposing more and more of your tank, and then by using the three second delay and the relative position of your vehicle at the time, you can use that to deduce where the enemy is. And this allows you to know where the enemy is going to be in a defensive uh, position, or just gather information that someone is there looking at you. Because of that, it, it does something no other crew scale does. And it scales very well with personal performance as you get better at the game. Your ability to abuse the mechanics of Sixth Sense is going to improve. The next tier is going to be S tier, and these are going to be the must-haves. These are crew skills you're going to want to get ASAP. You want to max these out as soon as possible because these abilities and effects cannot be replaced by equipment, consumables, or even other skills. So, first skill is going to be repairs. At 100% repairs, you basically have the repair time. And in World of Tanks, the most important module is going to be your tracks. So most repair time for tracks are going to be anywhere between 8 and 14 seconds. And when you have that, that's going to be 4 to 7 seconds. Even when you consider the worst case scenario having a 7 second track repair time, a lot of vehicles in the game do not have a 7 second or less re uh, reload time. And for that reason, it becomes very hard for most vehicles in the game to perma-track you. And what this means is it allows you to save a repair kit for engagements that are more vital or for other modules that are more critical to the performance of your tank, such as an ammo rack. Similarly, if you're in a situation where your ammo rack is, um, well, when your repair kit is down for 90 seconds, my bad, you're going to find that Having repair skill allows you to play aggressively or defensively 
because now you don't have to worry about being permatracked and killed in 1v1 scenarios. This means you do not limit yourself to engaging every 90 seconds on your repair kit and open up your tank to more opportune and more flexible engagements that may occur in the game. Second skill is going to be Camouflage. Camouflage at 100% increases the base camo value of your tank by 80%. The reason why this is so useful is it turns, say, a 10% base camo into 18%, right? 8% bonus or 80% increase off of the base value. And for most lights, mediums, and tank destroyers, you're going to have anywhere between 10 or 20% camo, sometimes a little more um, than that in some extreme cases for lights. But what this means is when you convert that uh, base camo into the increased bonus from camo skill, you're going to have anywhere from, as I said before, 8% all the way up to potentially 20% camo increase. And as a shorthand and a rule of thumb, 1% of camo translates to approximately 4 4 meters reduction in spotting range. And using the previous values, this means you get anywhere from about 40 meters all the way up to 80 meters in spotting range reduction. And for a class or a tank type that requires information or vision control, limiting the ability for the enemy to spot you is incredibly valuable, possibly more valuable than spotting the enemy yourself. The last skill that deserves to be in this tier, and something that a few players have actually told me have been wrong, but I'll tell you why they're wrong, it's going to be Brothers in Arms. And Brothers in Arms is interesting because it offers a 5% increase in crew qualifications for the entire crew. Now you have to also consider that this also stacks with the commander bonus. So while it's 5% for the commander, the commander bonus of 10% means it's 5.5% for all the other crew members. And while the qualifications doesn't mean much, when you convert it into vehicle performance, it's anywhere between 2.2% about for the commander to 2.4% for everyone else that's not the commander. And this means you get stats like 2.2% view range, you get things like 2.4% on accuracy, aim time, traverse, terrain resistance reduction. Basically, everything that's controlled by a crew member gets boosted by that amount. And this is huge because these small bonuses such as reload, um, accuracy, aim time, um, even terrain resistance isn't really offered in these values by any crew skill in the game. There may be some crew skills that are competitive with it in one aspect, but loses out in literally every other field. On top of this, there's a hidden bonus of Brothers in Arms that's not really spoken about, and it increases the skill level of all skills, not perks, by 5%. And this is additive. So let's say we have 100% camo, it becomes 105%. If we have 50% repairs, it becomes 55%. And because of this, and the way this applies to all skills, once you have Brothers in Arms, it offers high value when you select it, and it continues to offer value as your skills increase for the crew. So it's a continuous return and re uh, return on investment for the value. A tier are skills that are quite useful. They're the best after the must-haves. They are skills you should get as soon as possible when it comes to rounding out the vehicle. And A tier high utility skills are ones that offer the highest return for the skill slots they occupy. So first one, as an example, is going to be situational awareness. It's obvious. This is a standard 3% increase in view range for your vehicle in a game that's about controlling vision, controlling information gathering information by seeing 3% further out, which is usually about 10 meters to 12 meters, is quite useful. And for even heavies and slow tank destroyers, passively spotting that further out is going to help your team, and it's going to help you. For the next skill, it's going to be Deadeye. 
this has been controversial, and I actually have a few arguments with a few uh, other people about its utility in being an A tier. And the reason why is Deadeye at 100% increases the module hit chance by 3%. Now, this 3% is not multiplicative, it's additive. So, a, as an example, a 27% module hit on a ammo rack becomes 30%. A 45% on an engine becomes 48%. And the reason why this is so useful is if you convert those additive percentages into an actual return, you get anywhere between 6.7 and 11.1% increased module damage throughout your entire module hit lifespan. And that's huge. And the reason why it offers so much utility and why it's rated so highly by me is if you hit an engine, if you hit a fuel tank, you hit an ammo rack and set someone on fire or cripple their ability to reload, you buy yourself time, right? Or if you hit a crew member that's vital to the tank, like a loader or a driver or a gunner, multiple times, you make the enemy play defensively. It buys yourself time. It weakens their tank. When you weaken their tank, you increase the possibility of you either winning the engagement, preserving more of your health to carry more games or more fights later on, or you just allow yourself to survive in an engagement where you're outnumbered or outmatched for longer. And there's no other skill in the game that can offer that utility for you. The next skill that deserves to be up here is going to be off-road driving. Off-road driving is a little weird because it actually does have a situational nuance to it with a massive asterisk. And I must mention that. And that's because... In World of Tanks, there's three different terrain types. There's hard terrain, which is going to be paved roads. It's going to be any pathways that you'll see in dirt. Uh, anything that looks like it's traversed by anybody or a vehicle or a tank, it's going to be considered hard terrain. Medium terrain is going to be anything that's not paved, not a road. So that means anything that's grass, dirt, anything that's on a map is usually going to be medium terrain. And the last one is going to be soft terrain. This is going to be terrain that is hard to traverse. It's typically going to be muddy areas, um, areas with puddles or water in it. So basically swamps or hard traverse areas where your tank could realistically get stuck in real life. And what off-road driving does, it does 0% in hard terrain. So it offers no bonus to your vehicle offers a 2.5% reduction in terrain resistance on medium terrain and a 10% reduction in terrain resistance on soft terrain. And the reason why it's so good and why it's rated so highly is this terrain resistance reduction translates to about that exact same percentage in acceleration, top speed, or effective top speed rather, which is different from the actual top speed, because effective is how fast your vehicle can actually go on that terrain and whole traverse, right? So effectively, it's the trifecta of mobility for your vehicle on those terrain types. You move that much faster in acceleration, you go that much quicker, and you turn that much better. And no other crew skill outside the Brothers in Arms can increase your vehicle's mobility directly as much as off-road driving. The last crew skill that deserves to be up here is going to be intuition. It's a loader skill, and at 100%, it's going to allow you to reduce your reload by 60% when changing round types when you're fully loaded. And after the change in 1.13 to this new type of uh, mechanic, it has become objectively one of the best skills in the game. And this is because a lot of round types in the game and a lot of high tier vehicles have bad round distributions. What I mean by that is you have vehicles that have AP or APCR as a standard round, a heat, high pen gold round, and then you have a high damage HE round. And the main problem with this is for a lot of vehicles, you're going to be debating between high velocity standard versus low velocity and bad shell mechanic heat. And this causes problems in a lot of engagements where you're fighting both soft tanks and hard tanks, say a Leo 1 and an E100. If you're playing a tank that's fighting both of those, 
Keep may not be ideal against a Leo 1 because it can dodge the shell, or it might go to tracks for zero damage. Your standard AP or AP serum might not be good for an E100 because you can't pen through certain parts of its tank. So having intuition, which reduces your reload and swap time, means you have higher effective DPM because you spend less time wasting rounds or changing rounds and more time actually shooting at the enemy tanks. It also has the ability for your tank, or it opens up the ability for your tank, to change to an HE round, the high damage round type, against paper tanks. And this means you can either kill tanks quicker if you get like vulnerable areas such as engine decks or roof shots, or against like Scorpion Gs or mid to high tier paper TDs, you can change the engagement from a three shot kill to a two shot kill, which means you save yourself some time, save yourself some HP by eliminating the threat much quicker. The only downside, caveat to this skill, is it does not work well on auto reloaders because if you're fully loaded, it allows you to reload the first shell faster. So auto reloaders don't really find much use in intuition. It's quite bad. But on the other hand, it's really good for auto loaders where you're stuck with the round types you have for a full drum. And be able to go from all heat to all APCR for an auto loader is quite useful and valuable. Next here is going to be B tier. These are skills that are useful. They're not as good as A tier, but once you have all A tier skills, you can go to this tier. These are skills that still offer bonuses to your tank. They're not as good as a value pick compared to the high utility skills, but they still offer relatively good returns. The first skill is going to be Recon. And what this does is it offers 2% V range. And uh, as you can see, 3% Situational awareness, 2% recon. It's pretty obvious why this goes below it, because 3% minus 2% is a... Let me check my notes. 1% difference. And some may argue that recon has a secondary ability, which reduces the penalty on view range for a broken observation device. The reason why this doesn't really matter is because your view range is only affected when the observation device is broken when there's a red border on the module. It has to be completely destroyed and not damaged. And most of the time, if your module is broken for observation devices, you're usually so close to the enemy for them to get that type of shot that it doesn't matter. You don't need to see the enemy tanks. And if they do destroy it from far range, you can wait the 15 to 20 seconds it takes to repair the module. And for that reason, the secondary ability of Recon is quite worthless. It doesn't actually come into play, and if it does, it doesn't really do anything. The next skill that goes up here is going to be Snapshot. Snapshot, at its max level, reduces dispersion penalties on turret rotation by 7.5%. For pretty much every vehicle in the game, you're going to be moving your turret. Whether you're shooting them close range or shooting them far range, Reducing the amount of time it takes for you to fully aim in, or even have your circle be smaller, um, is going to be extremely useful all the time, either for snapshots or for getting a fraction of a second um, better aim on the enemy tanks. Only thing, don't use it on the STRV tank destroyers because they don't have the ability to move their gun. But this applies to any vehicle that has gun traverse. So tank destroyers with arcs still applies. The next skill is going to be Clutch Breaking. Clutch Breaking, basically, all it does is increase the whole traverse by 5%. Um, the reason why it's here is because I would say it offers less utility, but doesn't have a situational condition like offer driving. Um, but the 5% extra whole traverse is the best bonus you can get to mobility in cities. In medium terrain, offer driving can offer almost the same benefits, but if you're playing a city fight as a heavy tank or a tank destroyer where hold traverse or being circled is a threat, um, having this skill is the best skill in its type. And that's essentially 
stop yourself from being circled, allow yourself to point your front towards the enemy sooner, allow yourself to angle quicker, basically all this stuff is what clutch breaking does, and why it's so useful for those two particular class types. The next skill, Smooth Ride. Smooth Ride decreases your dispersion penalties on hull movement, forward and back only, not turning, by 4%. This may not seem like a lot, but when it comes to numerical value, it offers about the same returns as Snapshot. The main reason why Smooth Ride is not as good and it has been considered to be a niche skills is because it's only forward and back movement. And in World of Tanks, it's possible to mitigate the need for this skill entirely by using Cruise Control, which is the R and F keys to decrease the movement of your vehicle um, and basically have no need for the skill. But it has some utility for some heavy tanks that are going to be side scraping or for mediums or lights that want to be aiming in quicker because they're moving from high speed to slow speed so it's going to affect them quite badly. Because you're going to be moving forward and back a lot and even though it's not that great of a skill by itself, 4% is still a 4% reduction and that is still going to be a fraction of your aim time. For heavies that are brawling, when you're side scraping, that's all you're going to be doing. You'll be moving forward and back in top speed. So decreasing the time it takes to aim means you have more time getting your gun on target, less time exposing your tank. Skill after that is going to be safe stowage. Safe stowage is interesting because a lot of people would say I'm crazy for putting it this far down and not in A tier. The reason is, safe stowage is a conditional skill. It's situational. It doesn't work all the time, and its utility isn't on every... Its utility isn't applicable on every tank. And the main reason why it, it is considered so highly and regarded so well is because the old generic opinion of, hey, your tank gets ammo racked a lot. Safe stowage will prevent your tank from getting ammo racked. And then placebo comes in, and you put it on, and you find that, oh, I don't see the ammo rack occurring as much as before. All right. But here's the problem. That is not what safe stowage does. Safe stowage does not decrease the probability of your ammo rack being damaged. It, it increases your ammo rack health. And there's a big distinction between the two. And, again, for high tiers, tier 8 and plus, Every tank in the game is going to be having their ammo rack destroyed in two shots or less. And because of that, safe stowage doesn't actually change this two-shot threshold. Every vehicle that gets ammo racked in two shots will continue to get ammo racked in two shots. And because of this, it's not good on vehicles that get ammo racked a lot. It's good on vehicles that have weak ammo rack health. As an example, you're going to use this to stop one-shot detonations, not two shots, which is what a lot of people have been using it for. Vehicles like the 279E, the IS-7, pretty much almost all Russian vehicles, and same thing with all Chinese vehicles, those vehicles have very low ammo rack health, and safe stowage puts their ammo rack health at a higher threshold to stop them from getting one shot from high caliber guns. High, big 150 millimeters, 155 millimeters, you know, those large caliber tank destroyers, they will no longer one shot you. For vehicles like the Leo or the Super Conqueror, those vehicles have very high ammo rack health. Bad positions, so they get damaged a lot, but because of the high base health, they don't actually detonate in one shot. For that reason, those vehicles where you would most likely put safe stowage on don't actually need them. There is one very niche conditional and uh, use case where safe stowage actually has some viability, but it's extreme. And it's on vehicles where you can get ammo racked a lot, but you have high base health, like a super conch. Um, and these vehicles like a super conqueror can theoretically use it against very low caliber guns. Because module damage is based on the gun caliber, 
if a Super Conqueror uses it on any 100mm gun, or a Leo, or any 260 ammo rack health vehicle, it changes the engagement from a 2-shot ammo rack to potentially a 3-shot ammo rack. And that is pretty much the only use case for it in high ammo rack health vehicles. Otherwise, don't bother. Uh, general rule of thumb, if your MRAC health of your vehicle is less than 240, take safe stowage. Otherwise, it's up to you if you want to take it, but usually it's going to be a wasted skill. And as for finding the MRAC health, you can find it on third-party websites uh, such as tanks.gg. And that sums it up for B tier. So C tier is going to be what I define as niche. These are skills that do have utility, and they are good in some cases, or are only good on certain vehicles, where if put on those vehicles or in those conditions and situations, it will potentially be as good as a B-tier skill. And the first one is going to be Jack of All Trades. Jack of All Trades at 100% allows your commander to take place of that other crew member at 50% proficiency. And what this means is if your driver dies and your commander is still alive, you're going to have a 50% driver. And the commander will still operate his own role. Now what's interesting about Jack of All Trades is it spreads out to all crew members. If your commander's alive and you lose two crew members, he pilots both of them at 33%. Or if three crew members are dead, he pilots all of them at 25%. So it's a very interesting skill. It has some use cases, but the reason why it's niche is it's not really consistent. You need several things to fall into place. You need to lose several crew members. You need to lose a single crew member multiple times to the point where your medkit's on cooldown or your medkit can't revive all of them. Or an interesting niche case, which is what this applies to, is if you're playing a build that doesn't use a medkit. In certain vehicle classes, um, and vehicle types, like a fast heavy, where you're very armored, but your driver is exposed because he's in the front hull, you can use jack of all trades as a driver replacement and assume that your driver is going to be the only casualty and allow yourself to put another consumable in its place. And this opens up things like extra engine power and food for your vehicle and etc. etc. But again, it doesn't apply to all vehicles, it's very niche, um, but it is something that is a good holdover for when your medkit is down. It's just a medkit being down for a long period of time with multiple crew members dead is not very common. The next one, sound detection. This is one of the new skills, and I don't think this skill is actually that bad. Uh, sound detection allows you to, well, what it does is at 100%, if an artillery clicks on your vehicle and your vehicle is within the reticle at the time the artillery has clicked, meaning there's a possibility of the shell flying into you, you will get a notification on your screen like Sixth Sense. The reason why this is good is for heavies, paper TDs, um, static lights or static um, snipers, it's quite useful because if you know where the enemy artillery is going to be positioned, and you know where you are relative to that positioning, you will know what the general reticle is going to look like for the enemy artillery. And for slow vehicles, this means you can angle yourself ahead of time at a weird off 45 degree, and if the enemy shoots at you, you back off, and then their shell goes right here. So you back out of that shell. And this reduces the amount of artillery damage you're gonna take from the splash. So for slow heavies, this can be useful, especially because artillery don't typically move and they're pretty static in starting positions. And by reducing the amount of arty splash you take, you increase the amount of health you're going to have over the course of a game. For paper tanks, uh, fast vehicles and static vehicles, like static passive lights, sniping TDs like a Leo, um, which I consider a TD, um, paper tanks like a Hellcat, Knowing that the enemy already shooting at you 
and knowing that you're fast means you can completely avoid the arty hit. Because if they're shooting at you, you know what their general reticle is going to be like, you can completely dodge it with your speed. Now, here's the problem with this skill. Is one, it's only really useful on static vehicles where you're not going to be moving a lot. It requires artillery to be on the enemy team, so there are cases where you'll have the skill and it doesn't do anything. Or, what's funny is it doesn't actually activate if you're driving into an arty shell. If an enemy fires at the ground and you're driving right into it, because you were not in the reticle at the time the arty clicked and fired, you will not have this notification, so it's possible if arty is aiming ahead and pre-aiming and leading your shots, uh, you can get hit for full damage. And this skill does nothing for you. So if you have one of those very particular playstyles where you're static, not moving, playing passive, or slow, pretty useful. But again, there's a lot of conditions you have to fulfill where this skill becomes usable. But when they are, it's quite helpful because reducing RD damage and passive damage, right, slow bleed is very, very good. The next skill, designated target. This is arguably a better skill for lights than anything else, and that's mostly because the condition that it applies in. When it's fully skilled and fully leveled up, if an enemy tank is within 15 degrees of your gun in a cone, you're going to light them for a few more seconds. Now, there's already a few problems with this because one, you have to be spotting the tank yourself. If you can't spot them, but someone else is, this does nothing. Two, they have to be within your gun arc. So if you're not aiming at an enemy tank, it doesn't actually do anything. And because of that, for vehicles that might use like mediums or tank destroyers, you might find yourself considering this tank skill, but it just doesn't really come into play because if you're a tank destroyer and you're sniping or being passive, you're not really going to see them, and if you do, you're probably going to be shooting and getting spotted in return. And for a light tank, it's good because there's no real good gunner skills. You're going to be passive more than half the time, and you're going to be able to choose which and who is going to be spotted for longer. Another reason why I think this skill is not great is the current meta has a lot of close range maps. So if you're not a light tank, you're sort of wasting the skill for a medium or a tank destroyer on something that's better. Um, and it's a little tricky to use because you have to make sure that when you are applying that extra spotting time, that the enemy isn't able to get into cover. Because sometimes if you spot them for 10 seconds normally, they get into cover and nobody can shoot them. Looking at them and spotting them for 2 or 3 extra seconds and they're them being in cover doesn't really change that outcome. They're still going to be in cover and not taking damage. So there's a lot of ifs and or buts, but for a light, it's pretty much unanimous. This is going to be a good utility. The next skill, as niche, is going to be controlled impact. At 100% skill, Controlled Impact increases the ram damage you deal by 15% and reduces the amount of ram damage you take by 15%. And the reason why it's niche and why it's moved up from its poor utility from the past is recent field mods and recent equipment, which increases engine power and speed, um, has changed the game into a speedier meta. Tanks are much faster than they used to be across the board. And because of this, ramming as a side effect and pretty obvious conclusion, has become more common. As a result, for an offensive option for ramming, increasing the ram damage you do by 15% is quite good. It might allow you to do more damage or save yourself a shell, or allow you to kill someone before they get another shot on you. For a defensive option, it reduces the enemy ram damage, and in fact, if two tanks have this skill, it counters it itself out. But as a defender, if you're using it and the enemy doesn't, you reduce the damage you take, and you increase the damage you reflect back to them by 15%. So it's a good counter meta, 
And it's a good meta skill because you're faster, you can ram, or you're stopping somebody from ramming you. The only downside though is ramming is still something that you don't want to do. Um, you typically will put yourself in a bad situation if you ram because you may overexpose yourself. But if you're going to be doing that or you're going to expect that something like that can occur against your tank, like uh, say if you're an EVA 90 or a very light vehicle, you can save yourself some damage, especially because some vehicles will suffer from light taps against common engagements where you want to minimize the amount of HP you bleed. Adrenaline Rush goes down here. And the reason why it's niche is Adrenaline Rush at 100% will decrease your reload by 9.1%, but requires you to be under 10% health. And it's that condition that makes this so bad. Most vehicles, if they're at 10% or less health, they're going to have under 200 HP. That's an easy artillery splash and easy HE damage from a lot of vehicles. And because of that, by the time this triggers, you're either going to be dead because the enemy is already on top of you at the point you're at that low HP, or you're dying. Now, the reason why it's still niche is on certain vehicles, if you have nothing better to get as a loader, this is still good. 9.1% reload can potentially allow you to get more shots at the end game when you're dying and supporting at far range for your allies. It allows you to, in an engagement where you're lagging behind on a trade, such as two equivalent vehicles, by having the tank that loses HP first, you can potentially compensate the reload uh, delay by getting Adrenaline Rush to trigger, and then you suddenly beat the enemy on reload, and you can turn a defeat into a victory. But the problem with it is, again, it is not going to activate consistently, it's not going to be something you can rely on, and it's something that's very hard to consistently use because the condition that you're going to be in when it's activated typically means you're dead. Now, there are some use cases that are more consistent to pull this off, and these are going to be high HP tanks with lots of armor. Uh, things like a mouse or E100, maybe even a Type 5, though it's easy to pen that, relatively speaking. Those tanks with the proper equipment can have upwards of say 300 something HP. And when you're at 300 health for a high armored vehicle, you're not going to get HE'd, even from Arty Splash. You're going to be hard to pen, and the 9.1% reload is going to be useful because those vehicles, uh, because they're heavies and they're chunky, they're going to have bad reloads to compensate. So this allows you to trade a little better in your dying breaths and your dying moments. And in that case, for those tanks, it can be moved up to a slightly higher value, but most of the time, this is still going to be rarely used, but still useful in certain conditions. Limited use are crew skills that are very rare to find value in, or if you do find value, it's a little too much investment for it. And one of these skills is firefighting. Now, firefighting is actually not bad, objectively speaking. Um, at 100%, it effectively reduces the amount of fire damage and the amount of ticks you take from fire by half. And because fire damage is based on the duration and the amount of internal module damage is also tied to damage dealt by the fire, you, one, decrease the damage you take, two, decrease how long the fire lasts, three, decrease internal module damage. And those three are pretty useful because that's what cripples your vehicle from a fire. But here's the problem with firefighting. It's easy to work around. You have a ex premium extinguisher, which automatically gets rid of the fire. You have a manual extinguisher, if you want to be cheap, that gets rid of the fire. You require yourself to be set on fire in the first place, which is already an uncommon occurrence. You also have the ability to offset the entire skill with a directive for 20,000 credits. And if you do get the skill, it's a huge opportunity cost. Your entire crew has to have it because it's averaged across the entire crew, like repairs and camouflage. But the thing is, if you're getting firefighting, that's four or five skills you're missing out on. And when you 
put that value of firefighting to other skills you could potentially have, it sort of goes down on the list because there's just not much value to be had. There's so much more you can gain and the fact that you can offset the entire skill with money is insane. Though, to be speaking from a competitive point of view, firefighting does go a little higher because when you're playing competitive, firefighting is something you don't, um, well, you really want, but you don't have the luxury of putting a directive for it and you're not gonna be using an extinguisher. But for general play, is typically not going to be useful. The next skill is Eagle Eye. Eagle Eye allows you to determine what modules are damaged or broken in an enemy vehicle after looking at them for three seconds. Here's the problem with Eagle Eye. One, it requires you to spot the tank yourself. He has to be within your spotting range, your tank has to be able to spot him. And if they do, you can see what modules are broken. But the problem with this is it also requires you to stare at them for a few seconds. And oftentimes, you don't want to be overexposing your vehicle to stare at somebody for that long. And if you are staring for someone at that long, you put yourself in two situations that are very common. You're trading with them, or you're going to be in a situation where you're forced to back off and, again, trade with them. You're basically putting your face into theirs. And at that point, you don't really need to know what's broken. And if you're playing a tank that's like playing around an enemy vehicle, like for example, a flanker, and you're shooting an enemy vehicle, and you're trying to activate Eagle Eye, it doesn't really offer anything. Because if you're flanking somebody and shooting them in the side, you're going to be going for ammo racks, you're going to be going for fuel tanks, you're going to be going for engines in optimal situations. And knowing that those things are damaged doesn't change what you shoot at, because you're still going to shoot at it. And if you have a high rate of fire, like an autoloader, um, you're not going to care because by the time the three seconds have happened, you've already emptied out a good chunk of your drum and your magazine. So you can't change what you shoot at, at that point. So because of that, it's not great. There are some cases, though, where you can abuse it, where if for some reason you do see the enemy has a dead loader, a damaged ammo rack, and you know they're not fixing it, you can abuse that, but again, with the way the game is played and the way positions are held, uh, oftentimes trying to abuse an enemy's poor situation by playing aggressively, uh, it doesn't really work out because you put yourself in a bad position, which means that even if it does proc, you're not going to be able to take advantage of it because it's just not viable most of the time. Armorer is a limited use. Basically, if your gun is broken, at 100% skill, it reduces the penalty by 50%. So instead of doubling your accuracy from like 0.3 to 0.6, you get half of that. So you get 0.45, it's smack dab in the middle. This is pretty decent. Um, it basically allows you to keep an accurate gun. But the problem with Armorer is one, your repair kit has to be down. Two, your gun has to be broken. And while that seems like some very easy conditions to fulfill, because guns do break sometimes, and your repair, tank, or your repair, skill, repair kit is going to be gone a lot if you're playing aggressively. It's something that doesn't really become reliable to abuse and take advantage of. If you're close up to an enemy and they're purposely breaking your gun, as something that would happen to, say, a Super Conqueror, because a weak spot is in the gun, then you're so close to the enemy that you don't need armor. And if you're at far range, the chance of an enemy hitting your gun and breaking it and you having a repair kit down is very unlikely, at which case armor doesn't even proc because your gun's not broken. So it's not that great. It's not that useful. Uh, pretty much the only tanks that would ever use this are going to be tank destroyers, where every shot really matters and your gun's pretty much going to be something people break either by accident or on purpose. Um, or a heavy tank where you're going to be hauled down and some tanks like to counter you by breaking your accuracy. But generally, for most vehicles, not great. We're going to have Call for Vengeance down here. Call for Vengeance has some limited use and the reason why is Call for Vengeance allows you to continue spotting for two more seconds after you die. And that sounds great, but it has one condition. You have to die. 
And if you're spotting and you die, you sort of have let your team down as pretty much a light tank or medium tank scouting. Being dead is not something you want to have happen because you're gathering information for your team. But if you're going to die and you want to abuse the fact that some enemies might get over aggressive at the death of a light or a spotter, you can use this tank or use this skill to get more information in situations where that otherwise would be literally impossible. So for the most part, it, because the death condition, it's not great, but in some competitive scenarios, it is quite useful because it delays the enemy or gathers more information for two seconds longer. It's just not something that would happen commonly in most battles. Now, the E tier is going to be absolutely useless skills. The first skill is Mentor. Mentor increases the crew XP of every crew member except the commander that has it by 10%. Now, the interesting thing about Mentor is it actually is, in my opinion, a decent skill. Uh, in World of Tanks, the end game grind isn't vehicles. It's going to be crew. And for Mentor that boosts the amount of crew XP you're getting, it's quite valuable. Um, but here's the problem. The opportunity cost of getting Mentor for a hypothetical commander comes at you getting it for six cents, repairs, potentially camouflage, Brothers in Arms, Situational Awareness, right? Because a lot of commanders are radio operator hybrids. Recon, right? And then you have to compete against like the secondary skills such as Jack of All Trades or Sound Detection. And because of that, you're spending too much time getting this skill when there are other more game influencing skills that are available to you. And when you have those other skills that can potentially win games, which gives you more base XP for that battle, you one, win games, one, do more, so your XP increases, so you increase the active XP generation versus mentor, which is passive generation. And while the passive generation of mentor is better, it doesn't offer anything for victories. On top of this, there are so many crew skill bonuses in directives and like boosters that it doesn't really help. So Mentor is quite bad because of how much it takes to get it. And by the time you do get it at the end, you're at such high crew skill levels, it doesn't do anything. Preventive Maintenance. This is interesting, but what it does is it decreases the fire chance of your engine by 25%. Now here's the reason why this is bad. I'll keep it. Fuel tanks. Fuel tanks can blow up. And when fuel tanks blow up, you get set on fire. So the reason why this skill is bad is because you can, re well, it doesn't help your fuel tank, which is the one thing that breaks the most. And what is the general cause of fires for most vehicles? So not great. Um, it's something I rate very lowly. In fact, I rate it lower than firefighting because firefighting at least decreases the amount of fire damage you take. And if you're going to be set on fire through fuel tanks, you may as well have that over something that triggers on engine fire chance. Not to mention that a lot of vehicles, as a side note, have their fuel tanks surrounding the engine. So if your engine's being shot, typically the fuel tank goes first because the fuel tank is easier to shoot at and it's going to be triggering the hit chance first and it's, it has less HP. So it's easier to break. Next skill, signal boosting. This increases the signal range, which is the radio range of your vehicle, by 20%. And this means you're able to gather what your team sees, because the way the game works is you have teammates that see something, the radio it back to you, and then you see them too. This increases the range at which you can communicate with your allies to tell them what you see. Right, it's basically a passive communication thing in the game. But here's the bad thing about signal boosting. A lot of vehicles don't have bad signal range. In fact, a lot of vehicles have good radios of having somewhere around 800 meters, 700 to 800 meters of signal range. 
So this skill is relatively pointless because if you're outside of those ranges for some reason, you're so far out of the map that any information you can gather there is either from a literal corner from one side to the other corner, and it doesn't really affect you. Relaying is the same. At 100%, it boosts your allies. And in fact, it's the only skill in the entire game that has an effect on allies. Um, it boosts their radio range by 10%. Now, this skill is also just as bad because again, radio ranges for a lot of vehicles are going to be good. You're going to have high radio range at high tier. Even in the middle tiers, you're going to have somewhere like 600 meters. So increasing the radio range of your allies to have them transfer information to you is not going to ever be really useful. There is one rare situation where this may become a O, oh, not even an okay, like a, a D skill tier. And that's if you're playing artillery and the enemy is quite literally on the other corner of the map. But the problem with that is if they're that far out where you need this skill to help you see them, you're probably not going to have the artillery range to hit them. So in the use case that this can be used and have some decent application, it doesn't actually do anything. Anyways, that should make up my entire crew skill tier list. Let me see if there's anything I would change. No. I think the only thing I would potentially change on this crew skill tier list may be preventative maintenance, just going at the bottom end of the D list. And the main reason why that would be the case is it, you can argue that 25% engine fire chance reduction is still better than nothing. But competing against firefighting, I would rather have, in my opinion, one person on firefighting rather than a 25% reduction in engine fire chance for just the engine. Because, as I said before, fuel tank fires are more common, reducing fire damage by about 10-12% to 12 from just one crew member having it is, in my opinion, better than the driver having preventative. Anyways, hopefully you guys enjoyed this. If you guys want more videos like this or enjoy this type of content, let me know. Um, you know this came out of most people asking for a updated tier list and the reasoning. Anyways... You guys have a good one and see you in the comments.